See the pyramids along the Nile. Watch a sunset from a tropic isle. Just remember, Rita, all the while, you belong to me. This story took place 50 years ago. It took me that long to figure out the value, the moral of it. It's entitled, Ronnie, Rita, and Me. On my 50cc Honda, a newly minted toy of a motorcycle, Glenn Quenzer and I, we are, after an evening of dipping into the folk music scene at the Gilded Cage in downtown Philadelphia, returning to Mayfair in the great Northeast. We've been pushing the envelope of loyalty to our hood and boyhood pals recently, and have been hanging out with strangers, older kids, college girls wearing leotards, Ben Franklin-eyed men sporting goatees, elbow patches, and berets. And folky singing Woody Guthrie and dilettantes acting like Rimbaud. I developed a serious interest in the writings of Bob Dylan and had found the Gilded Cage in my search for poetry. Operated by Esther and Ed Halpern, the coffee house with backroom stage is ground zero for folk music and bohemian pursuits in Philadelphia. The very first cover charge of my life, I pay here. Now, Glenn and I, we're still card-carrying members of our teenage gang, The Wall. Our gang's moniker a result of the location where we congregate. On and aside, a low retaining wall in front of a large house at Walker Street and Hartel. It seems there was a strange attraction between the girls of Holmesburg and the boys of Mayfair. And the stone wall served as a uh, maypole of sorts, a touchstone for adolescent hearts to swing around and voices to sing a cappella in front of. Now, because my interest in the poetry of folk music and Glenn's interest in playing guitar and singing on stage are outside the common interests, mostly drinking and fist fighting, of others in the wall, Glenn and I have kept our growing passions our interest in the arts, to ourselves. This Friday, we have opted out of going to a major dance at the Concord Roller Rink, a somewhat serious sin of omission, as you never know if there will be trouble for someone at the wall, especially given the events of my life the last couple of weeks. And my mouth and Glenn's fists have always been part of the wall's arsenal. Should there be trouble, as there sometimes is, we're surely going to be missed. Heading east, Hoping to rendezvous with the gang, when the dance lets out, we're cruising in and out of the electric buses and automobile traffic on Frankfurt Avenue. <laughs> Debbie Marion, in her customized 1964 and a half powder blue convertible Mustang, recognizes me in honks and waves. As she uh, <laughs> revs her 210 horsepower, 289 cubic inch V8 at the Robbins Avenue red light. Part of me has always hankered for Debbie because, after all, her tail bumper sports a sticker that reads, Beat me, you can eat me. <laughs> always the devotee of ice cream and custard, and knowing Glenn still has a few bucks left from his grandfather's stash, I downshifted and into the parking lot of Geno's west of Levick Street. The frozen treats here, they, they ain't Briars, hell, they're not even Dolly Madison. But I gotta say, I crave sometimes the vanilla chocolate double swirl soft serve custard that Gino serves. When Glenn is flush, he seems to go for burgers and fries, which are outside my budget. So here we are, standing at the walk up window, enjoying, as always, the look and presence of unfamiliar people and places. For as I like to say, who knows where love hides? When a familiar and exceedingly unwelcome face appears behind me, the face of my nemesis, Ronnie Ryan. He's in line 
tapping on my shoulder. And he's accompanied by his Bridesburg posse, some eight or nine thugs, none of whom are smaller than me. I say unwelcome because last month alone, I was beaten badly by Ronnie Ryan twice. First in Wildwood, New Jersey, and then in Wissanoming Park. All because the very girl I'm hoping to rendezvous with after the dance lets out, Rita Romero, has been making out with both me and Ronnie, double dipping one might say, while when alone, together, professing to be going steady with each of us. Naturally, the 17-year-old honor code of 1965 dictates that we fight each other anytime we meet. Easy for him to subscribe to at 6'2 and 220 pounds, but not so easy for me at 5'8 and 160 pounds. Not to mention, in all the fights I've ever had, I've never ever won. <sighs> the Wildwood deal went down brutally and foolishly after we'd encountered each other on the boardwalk in front of the Starlight Ballroom. Believe you me, I was not keen on fighting Ronnie Ryan, given his hulking size and cocky smirking glowering. But I had no choice if I was going to maintain my honor with my gang friends, with whom I had just hitched 90 miles to be here. Because fighting on the boardwalk would surely lead to being arrested, Ronnie and I decided to take our fight away from the eye of the police, who maintain a heavy presence amongst the boardwalk throngs. We left our friends, his and mine, to trash talk each other, and we headed west of Oak Avenue in search of a secluded spot to fight. The whole time we're strutting and posturing, I'm wondering at the depth of my foolish pride, for I know in my heart there's no way I can win. Hell, I'll be lucky to get out of this with all my teeth. All I can hope for is a miracle or a lucky punch. So, into the dark side yard of a small summer cottage we go. Oddly, we are surrounded by big, beautiful, full-bloom roses on the perimeter of the yard, hundreds of them. They will serve incongruously as the ropes of our boxing ring. Not waiting for the imaginary bell to ring, I throw the first half a dozen punches the instant he turns to face me, and I connect with enough force to raise a welt on his left eye, and my St. Joe's preparatory Jesuit high school ring has cut his flesh and drawn a little blood below his right eye. I keep throwing punches, most of which he blocks by crossing his arms in front of his face. I go for his midsection, hoping for that miracle, but I'm already tiring after punching furiously and dancing to avoid his grasping me. Ronnie seems not to have any real boxing skills and simply appears intent on wrestling me to the ground. With all my remaining strength, I throw a wild left hook and connect with the side of his head. But the Cyclops that is Ronnie just keeps advancing. And then I'm done for, as he gets his arms around me, trips me with a foot behind, and smashes me to the ground. Soon he's got my arms pinned with his knees and his body with his ass. His fists are now free to pound me, my face, at will. The full moon in the midnight sky behind his head forms an ironic halo given the demon I consider him to be. His first punch lands not quite squarely. As in utter panic, I squirm with all my strength beneath him, causing him to lose his balance atop me slightly, a result of which my eye tooth fang rips the flesh above his index knuckle. As he raises his fist to deliver a second blow, blood drips in my eye. He spits at me, and then just as he's about to deliver what portends to be a knockout, the miracle I didn't have time to pray for happens. The yard lights come on, and a tiny little woman with a voice as big as she is small lets us know, I've already called the cops. They're on their way. Get the hell out of my yard. And off of me, Ronnie Ryan flies. And before you know it, we're both on our way back to the boardwalk as fast as our feet will carry us. Ronnie on one side of Oak Avenue and me on the other. Honor is one thing, but cops are something else. When we get to the starlight, our friends surround us. Now from the look of things, Ronnie with his one eye shut, his bloody cheek in hand, it looks as if I've won, although both Ronnie and I are well aware of who is about to see stars. Surprised my teeth are still intact, I can't believe what I say next. Hey, this ain't over yet. I want you Tuesday night in Wissanoman Park, 9 o'clock, and then we'll see who's going steady with Rita. 
Now, what prompted me to ask for another potential beating, I'll never know. The only possible thing I can come up with is my belief in miracles and my belief in love. But belief in miracles, like belief in hope, is not a good strategy. The next morning, I hitchhike back to Philadelphia. Rita calls to tell me that she can't believe that I actually fought Ronnie Ryan. That he looks so bad. He's got a serious black eye and stitches on his cheekbone and knuckles. That she's torn up about her mixed emotions. She goes as far as to say to me in a whisper, now whereas she and I have had some pretty orgasmic petting, that she's totally and especially confused because she's, quote, gone all the way with Ronnie only once, and she's not sure she can still see me, even though she swears she'll always love me. And I've already scheduled another fight, a fight I'm destined to lose again, for there won't be no little old lady turning on her lights in a rose garden. Tuesday night arrives, and I'm with my gang, the wall. Ronnie Ryan arrives with his Bridesburg gang. There must be close to 30 of us milling around in the middle of the park. My honor, Rita's honor, and Ronnie's honor are on the line. Sad I am to know that winning the fight does not mean that I'll be winning Rita. It would seem her woman's heart is in the corner where sex lay. That she'd done it with him and not me had taken me by surprise as the naive 17-year-old Irish Catholic in me had not seriously considered going that far yet. And now it's me and Cyclops in the middle of a park fighting because we have to. Again I land the first few punches, again damaging Ronnie's eye, but alas, Ronnie Ryan is intent again on wrestling me to the ground. And soon he's got me pinned. Kaboom! And I literally see stars as I wonder, is this what a concussion is? Kaboom! Again. And then, honor be damned, I concede, you win. I give up. To which he replies, you ain't nearly had enough. And then as he draws his back his fist to slam again my exposed defenseless face, he is lifted, literally, up into the air with a picture-perfect uppercut delivered by one of my posse, Bobby Brennan, who says, Eddie said he's had enough. And then all hell breaks loose as the wall and Bridesburg begin to rumble. Everybody's swinging except Ronnie, who appears to be walking about in a Cyclops nightmare. One eye again puffed shut, the other staring blankly. And then it's the sound of sirens, followed by the sight of paddy wagons in the west end of the park. Everyone skedaddles and retreats into the Wissanoming neighborhood night, including the befuddled Ronnie, who is guided to a car by two of his buds. No one gets arrested. Twice now, I've been saved by serious damage by the intervention of others. But now here we are again, as Ronnie Ryan stares me down, outside a Frankfurt Avenue fast food joint that serves frozen custard. Both his eyes seem to be working. The stitches are gone. His balled up fists in the neon light are the size of cantaloupes. The artist in me has already started cutting ties to my neighborhood gang. But now I'm wishing all my pals were here with me because my only friend, Glenn, well, he literally has a broken arm. We step out of the queue and I confer with him. I ask him quietly if he can drive my Honda with one hand and his broken arm. He nods in the affirmative, and I slip the key into his arm sling. Be ready, I tell him. I'll be back. I approach Ronnie and his gang, who are now clustered in between their cars. So what's up? Do we have to fight again? And Ronnie responds, no point in that. I'll just kick your ass again. I want the creep who hit me from behind. Hey, that's not what happened. It was a fair fight. And we were having it, and when I said I'd have enough, you should have been happy and quit. Instead, he did not relent, wanting to hurt me more. And my pal, he just put an end to it. His name's Bobby Brennan, Lincoln High star football player. He's a fullback. If you want to know what he looks like, hey, his picture's in the evening bulletin, along with all the others of all-stars. 
If you're looking for him, we hang at the Mayfair Bowling Alley. Come on by anytime. Believe me, Bobby Brennan won't mind ringing your chimes again, seeing as you don't obey the code of what a fair fight is. When someone concedes, it's over. Now, I sense that Ronnie's about to change his mind and go ballistic. So to get out of fighting him again, I preemptorily offer out the tallest of his pals. Hey, how about you and me across the street? Just you and me in the alley. You've come for blood, let's spill some. So here I go, again, fighting for a chick who's done it with my enemy. Fighting for an honor code that I've abandoned. This skinny creep I'm about to fight is so tall, I'm not sure I can even reach his face. So I put everything I got into body blows. My third punch knocks the wind out of him, and to the concrete on his knees he falls. I can't believe I've actually won a fight. I ask, hey man, come on, this is crazy. We don't know a thing about each other, and here we are, fighting. Why? But then his breath returns, and he's up on his legs and digging in a dumpster from which he retrieves a rather hefty piece of serious lumber with some nails, gnarly nails, sticking out of it. He swings wildly in my head, and when I duck, he smashes the two by six into the brick wall behind me. So forceful is his swing, the snud snap snaps upon impact. His torque propels him to spin, and I hit him with a roundhouse in the back of his ribs, and he falls to the ground wailing. Damn, you don't even know me, and you might have killed me with those nails if you'd not missed. You're crazy, man, and I kick him in the head with all the arc and power of a 40-yard field goal attempt, as this has long since ceased to be a fair boxing match. He rolls on his side, holding his cracked ribs, and I race, cross it back, I race back across Frankfurt Avenue, just as Glenn reels out of Gino's parking lot. I hop on back, and down the avenue we fly to the dance, where, for the last time, I am stood up by Rita, who is a no-show. Well, after Ronnie Ryan gathered up his pal with the cracked ribs, they headed for the Mayfair Bowling Alley looking for Bobby Brennan and me. But as I said, the wall was partying at the Concord Roller Rink, where Jerry Balabic was hosting a dance. Upon arrival at the Bowling Alley, the people Ronnie and his pals encounter are not the wall, Rather, they are a somewhat older group of 19 and 20 year old badass boys who occupy the inside of the bowling alley. Most are future cops, and many have already been to Vietnam and back. The wall deferred to them always and reverently, and amongst ourselves, we referred to them as the men. Ronnie and his pals were unaware that there were two gangs of boys who hung at the alley. So when they walked inside as if they owned the bowling alley, demanding to know where Bobby and Eddie were, they were met with the fury of the men who had no idea at all who Bobby and me were. The men only knew that we were from the hood and Ronnie and his pals were not. When the melee was over, Ronnie had two serious black eyes this time, and I do believe even his Bridesburg pals were done with looking for me and Bobby and done with defending Ronnie and or Rita's honor. Next morning, I call Rita to put an end to my misery. I give up, I tell her. Please, don't ever say we're going to meet again. After the dance, after school, or after you have sex with Ronnie. Her crying into the phone puts an end to my tirade. It's the last time we speak for close to 50 years. But in the end, both Ronnie and I we both want something for our, all of our machismo foolishness. Ronnie went on to marry the beautiful two-time Rita, and I went on to embrace my teenage reputation as one crazy and fearless dude, a reputation of which I was and am still quite proud, because it is an honor to live as such in the memory of boyhood pals. <laughs>